Sampson and Gregory, two servants of the House of Capulet, stroll through the streets of Verona. With body banter, Sampson vents his hatred of the House of Montague. The two exchange punning remarks about physically conquering Montague men and sexually conquering Montague women. Gregory sees two Montague servants approaching and discusses with Samson the best way to provoke them into a fight without breaking the law. Samson bites his thumb at the Montague's a highly insulting gesture. A verbal confrontation quickly escalates into a fight. Benvolio, a kinsman to Montague, enters and draws his sword in an attempt to stop the confrontation. Tybalt, a kinsman to Capulet, sees Benvolio's drawn sword and draws his own. Benvolio explains that he is merely trying to keep the peace. But Tybalt professes a hatred for peace as strong as his hatred for Montagues, and attacks. The brawl spreads. A group of citizens bearing clubs attempts to restore peace by beating down the combatants. Montague and Capulet enter, and only their wives prevent them from attacking one another. Prince Siskelis arrives and commands that the fighting stop, on penalty of torture. The Capulets and Montagues throw down their weapons. The prince declares the violence between the two families has gone on for too long and proclaims a death sentence upon anyone who disturbs the civil peace again. He says that he will speak to Capulet and Montague more directly on this matter. Capulet exits with him. The brawlers disperse, and Benvolio is left alone with his uncle and aunt. Montague and Lady Montague. Benvolio describes to Montague how the brawl started. Lady Montague asks whether Benvolio has seen her son, Romeo. Benvolio replies that he earlier saw Romeo pacing through a grove of sycamores outside the city since Romeo seemed troubled. Benvolio did not speak to him, concerned about their son. The Montagues tell Benvolio that Romeo has often been seen melancholy walking alone among the sycamores. They add that they have tried to discover what troubles him, but have had no success. Benvolio sees Romeo approaching, and promises to find out the reason for his melancholy. The Montagues quickly depart. Benvolio approaches his cousin. With a touch of sadness, Romeo tells Benvolio that he is in love with Rosalind but that she does not return his feelings and has sworn to live a life of chastity. Benvolio counsels Romeo to forget her by gazing at other beauties, but Romeo contends that the woman he loves is the most beautiful of all. Romeo departs, assuring Benvolio that he cannot teach him to forget his love. Benvolio resolves to do just that. On another street in Verona, Capulet walks with Paris, a noble kinsman of the prince. The two discuss Paris's desire to marry Capulet's daughter. Juliet Capulet is overjoyed, but also states that Yulita not yet Fortina is too young to get married. He asks Paris to wait two years. He assures Paris that he favors him as a suitor, and invites Paris to the traditional masquerade feast he is holding that very night so that Paris might begin to woo Juliet and win her heart. Capulet dispatches a servant, Peter, to invite a list of people to the feast. As Capulet and Paris walk away, Peter laments that he cannot read and will therefore have difficulty accomplishing his task. Romeo and Benvolio happen by, still arguing about whether Romeo will be able to forget his love. Peter asks Romeo to read the list to him. Rosalind's name is one of those on the list. Before departing, Peter invites Romeo and Benvolio to the part yeah, assuming, he says, that they are not Montagues. Benvolio tells Romeo that the feast will be the perfect opportunity to compare Rosalind with the other beautiful women of Verona. Romeo agrees to go with him, but only because Rosalind herself will be there. On another street in Verona, Capulet walks with Paris, a noble kinsman of the prince. The two discuss Paris's desire to marry Capulet's daughter, Juliet. Capulet is overjoyed but also states that Yulita not yet Fortina is too young to get married. He asks Paris to wait two years. He assures Paris that he favors him as a suitor, and invites Paris to the traditional masquerade feast he is holding that very night so that Paris might begin to woo Juliet and win her heart. Capulet dispatches a servant, Peter, to invite a list of people to the feast. As Capulet and Paris walk away, Peter laments that he cannot read and will therefore have difficulty accomplishing his task. Romeo and Benvolio happen by, still arguing about whether Romeo will be able to forget his love. Peter asks Romeo to read the list to him. Rosalind's name is one of those on the list. Before departing, Peter invites Romeo and Benvolio to the part yeah, assuming, 
He says that they are not Montagues. Benvolio tells Romeo that the feast will be the perfect opportunity to compare Rosalind with the other beautiful women of Verona. Romeo agrees to go with him, but only because Rosalind herself will be there. Romeo, Benvolio, and their friend Mercutio, all wearing masks, have gathered with a group of mask-wearing guests on their way to the Capulet's feast. Still melancholy, Romeo wonders how they will get into the Capulet's feast since they are Montagues. When that concern is brushed aside, he states that he will not dance at the dinner. Mercutio begins to gently mock Romeo, transforming all of Romeo's statements about love into blatantly sexual metaphors. Romeo refuses to engage in this banter explaining that in a dream he learned that going to the feast was a bad idea. Mercutio responds with a long speech about Queen Mab of the Fairies, who visits people's dreams. The speech begins as a flight of fancy, but Mercutio becomes almost entranced by it, and a bitter, fervent strain creeps in. Romeo steps in to stop the speech and calm Mercutio down. Mercutio admits that he has been talking of nothing, noting that dreams are but the children of an idle brain. January 4, 1997, Benvolio refocuses their attention on actually getting to the feast. Romeo voices one last concern, he has a feeling that the night's activities will set in motion the action of fate, resulting in untimely death. But, putting himself in the hands of he who hath the steerage of my course, Romeo's spirits rise, and he continues with his friends toward the feast. 1.4.112 In the Great Hall of the Capulets all is a bustle. The servants work feverishly to make sure all runs smoothly, and they set aside some food to make sure they have some enjoyment of the feast as well. Capulet makes his rounds through groups of guests, joking with them and encouraging all to dance. From across the room, Romeo sees Juliet and asks a serving man who she is. The serving man does not know. Romeo is transfixed. Rosalind vanishes from his mind and he declares that he has never been in love until this moment. Moving through the crowd, Tybalt hears and recognizes Romeo's voice. Realizing that there is a Montague present, Tybalt sends a servant to fetch his rapier. Capulet overhears Tybalt and reprimands him telling him that Romeo is well regarded in Verona and that he will not have the youth harmed at his feast. Tybalt protests, but Capulet scolds him until he agrees to keep the peace. As Capulet moves on, Tybalt vows that he will not let this indignity pass. Meanwhile, Romeo has approached Juliet and touched her hand. In a dialogue laced with religious metaphors that figure Juliet as a saint and Romeo as a pilgrim who wishes to erase his sin, he tries to convince her to kiss him since it is only through her kiss that he might be absolved. Juliet agrees to remain still as Romeo kisses her. Thus, in the terms of their conversation, she takes his sin from him. Juliet then makes the logical leap that if she has taken Romeo's sin from him, his sin must now reside in her lips, and so they must kiss again. Just as their second kiss ends, the nurse arrives and tells Juliet that her mother wants to speak with her. Romeo asks the nurse who Juliet's mother is. The nurse replies that Lady Capulet is her mother. Romeo is devastated. As the crowd begins to disperse, Benvolio shows up and leads Romeo from the feast. Juliet is just as struck by the mysterious man she has kissed as Romeo is with her. She comments to herself that if he is already married, she feels she will die. 1.5.131 To find out Romeo's identity without raising any suspicions, she asks the nurse to identify a series of young men. The nurse goes off and returns with the news that the man's name is Romeo, and that he is a Montague. Overcome with anguish that she loves a Montague, Juliet follows her nurse from the hall. Having left the feast, Romeo decides that he cannot go home. He must instead try to find Juliet. He climbs the wall bordering the Capulet property and leaps down into the Capulet to Orchard. Benvolio and Mercutio enter, calling out for Romeo. They are sure he is nearby, but Romeo does not answer. Exasperated and amused, Mercutio mocks Romeo's feelings for Rosalind in an obscene speech. Mercutio and Benvolio exit under the assumption that Romeo does not want to be found. In the orchard, Romeo hears Mercutio's teasing. He says to himself, he jests at scars that never felt a wound. February 2, 1943. Juliet suddenly appears at a window above the spot where Romeo is standing. Romeo compares her to the morning sun. Far more beautiful than the moon it vanishes. He nearly speaks to her but thinks better of it. Juliet, 
musing to herself and unaware that Romeo is in her garden, asks why Romeo must be Romeo Montague, and therefore an enemy to her family. She says that if he would refuse his Montague name, she would give herself to him or if he would simply swear that he loved her, she would refuse her Capulet name. Romeo responds to her plea, surprising Juliet since she thought she was alone. She wonders how he found her and he tells her that love led him to her. Juliet worries that Romeo will be murdered if he is found in the garden, but Romeo refuses to budge, claiming that Juliet's love would make him immune to his enemies. Juliet admits she feels as strongly about Romeo as he professes he loves her, but she worries that perhaps Romeo will prove inconstant or false, or will think Juliet too easily won. Romeo begins to swear to her, but she stops him, concerned that everything is happening too quickly. He reassures her, and the two confess their love again. The nurse calls for Juliet, and Juliet goes inside for a moment. When she reappears, she tells Romeo that she will send someone to him the next day to see if his love is honorable and if he intends to wed her. The nurse calls again, and again Juliet withdraws. She appears at the window once more to set a time when her emissary should call on him. They settle on nine in the morning. They exult in their love for another moment before saying goodnight. Juliet goes back inside her chamber, and Romeo departs in search of a monk to aid him in his cause. In the early morning, Friar Lawrence enters, holding a basket. He fills the basket with various weeds, herbs, and flowers, while musing on the beneficence of the earth. He demonstrates a deep knowledge of the properties of the plants he collects. Romeo enters and Friar Lawrence intuits that Romeo has not slept the night before. The friar fears that Romeo may have slept in sin with Rosalind. Romeo assures him that did not happen, and describes his new love for Juliet, his intent to marry her, and his desire that the friar consent marries them that very day. Friar Lawrence is shocked at this sudden shift from Rosalind to Juliet. He comments on the fickleness of young love, Romeo's in particular. Romeo defends himself, noting that Juliet returns his love while Rosalind did not. In response, the friar comments that Rosalind could see that Romeo's love for her did read by rote, that could not spell. Remaining skeptical at Romeo's sudden change of heart, Friar Lawrence nonetheless agrees to marry the couple. He expresses the hope that the marriage of Romeo and Juliet might end the feud ravaging the Montagues and Capulets. Later that morning, just before nine, Mercutio and Benvolio wonder what happened to Romeo the previous night. Benvolio has learned from a Montague servant that Romeo did not return home. Mercutio spouts some unkind words about Rosalind. Benvolio also relates that Tybalt has sent a letter to Romeo challenging him to a duel. Mercutio responds that Romeo is already dead. Struck by Cupid's arrow he wonders aloud whether Romeo is man enough to defeat Tybalt. When Benvolio comes to Romeo's defense, Mercutio launches into an extended description of Tybalt. He describes Tybalt as a master swordsman, perfectly proper and composed in style, according to Mercutio. However, Tybalt is also a vain, affected fashion monger. February 4, 2029. Mercutio disdains all that Tybalt stands for. Romeo arrives. Mercutio immediately begins to ridicule him claiming that Romeo has been made weak by love. As a way of mocking what he believes is Romeo's overout love for Rosalind, Mercutio takes the part of Romeo and compares Rosalind to all the most famous beauties of antiquity, finding Rosalind far superior. Then Mercutio accuses Romeo of abandoning his friends the previous night. Romeo does not deny the charge but claims his need was great, and so the offense is forgivable. From this proceeds intricate, witty and mildly sexual verbal jousting. The nurse enters, trailed by the servant, Peter. The nurse asks if any of the three young men know Romeo, and Romeo identifies himself. Mercutio teases the nurse, insinuating that she is a harlot, thus infuriating her. Benvolio and Mercutio take their leave to have dinner at Montague's house, and Romeo says he will follow shortly. The nurse warns Romeo that he had better not attempt to deal double with Juliet, and Romeo assures her he is not. He asks the nurse to tell Juliet to find some way to attend confession at Friar Lawrence's cell that afternoon there they will be married. The nurse agrees to deliver the message. The nurse also agrees to set up a cloth ladder so that Romeo might ascend to Juliet's room on their wedding night. In the Capulet orchard, Juliet impatiently waits for her nurse, 
whom she sent to meet Romeo three hours earlier. At last, the nurse returns, and Juliet anxiously presses her for news. The nurse claims to be too tired, sore, and out of breath to tell Juliet what has happened. Juliet grows frantic, and eventually, the nurse gives in and tells her that Romeo is waiting at Friar Lawrence's cell to marry her. The nurse departs to wait in the ally for Romeo's servant, who is to bring a ladder for Romeo to use to climb up to Juliet's chamber that night to consummate their marriage. Romeo and Friar Lawrence wait for Juliet to arrive at the cell. An ecstatic Romeo brashly states that he does not care what misfortune might come as it will pale in comparison to the joy he feels right now. Friar Lawrence counsels Romeo to love moderately and not with too much intensity, saying, These violent delights have violent ends. 2.6.9 Juliet enters and Romeo asks her to speak poetically of her love. Juliet responds that those who can so easily describe their worth are beggars, her love is far too great to be so easily described. The lovers exit with Friar Lawrence and are wed. As they walk in the street under the boiling sun, Benvolio suggests to Mercutio that they go indoors, fearing that a brawl will be unavoidable should they encounter Capulet men. Mercutio replies that Benvolio has as quick a temper as any man in Italy, and should not criticize others for their short fuses. Tybalt enters with a group of cronies. He approaches Benvolio and Mercutio and asks to speak with one of them. Annoyed, Mercutio begins to taunt and provoke him. Romeo enters. Tybalt turns his attention from Mercutio to Romeo and calls Romeo a villain. Romeo, now secretly married to Juliet and thus Tybalt's kinsman refuses to be angered by Tybalt's verbal attack. Tybalt commands Romeo to draw his sword. Romeo protests that he has good reason to love Tybalt and does not wish to fight him. He asks that until Tybalt knows the reason for this love, he put aside his sword. Mercutio angrily draws his sword and declares with biting wit that if Romeo will not fight Tybalt, he will. Mercutio and Tybalt begin to fight. Romeo, attempting to restore peace, throws himself between the combatants. Tybalt stabs Mercutio under Romeo's arm, and as Mercutio falls, Tybalt and his men hurry away. Mercutio dies cursing both the Montagues and the Capulets, a plague on both their houses, March 1, 1987, and still pouring forth his wild witticisms, ask for me tomorrow, and, you shall find me a grave man, 3.1.93 a 94. Enraged, Romeo declares that his love for Juliet has made him effeminate and that he should have fought Tybalt in Mercutio's place, when Tybalt, still angry, storms back onto the scene, Romeo draws his sword, they fight, and Romeo kills Tybalt. Benvolio urges Romeo to run a group of citizens outraged at the recurring street fights as approaching. Romeo, shocked at what has happened, cries oh, I am fortune's fool. And flees. 3.1.131 The prince enters, accompanied by many citizens, and the Montagues and Capulets. Benvolio tells the prince the story of the brawl emphasizing Romeo's attempt to keep the peace, but Lady Capulet, Tybalt's aunt, cries that Benvolio is lying to protect the Montagues. She demands Romeo's life. Prince Siskelis chooses instead to exile Romeo from Verona. He declares that if Romeo is found in the city, he will be killed. In Capulet's house, Juliet longs for night to fall so that Romeo will come to her untalked of and unseen. 3.2.7 Suddenly the nurse rushes in with news of the fight between Romeo and Tybalt, but the nurse is so distraught, she stumbles over the words, making it sound as if Romeo is dead. Juliet assumes Romeo has killed himself, and she resigns to die herself. The nurse then begins to moan about Tybalt's death, and Juliet briefly fears that both Romeo and Tybalt are dead. When the story is at last straight and Juliet understands that Romeo has killed Tybalt and been sentenced to exile, she curses nature that it should put the spirit of a fiend in Romeo's sweet flesh. 3.2.81a82 The nurse echoes Juliet and curses Romeo's name, but Juliet denounces her for criticizing her husband and she adds that she regrets folding him herself. Juliet claims that Romeo's banishment is worse than 10,000 slain Tybalt's. Juliet laments that she will die without a wedding night, a maiden widow. The nurse assures her, however, 
that she knows where Romeo is hiding and will see to it that Romeo comes to her for their wedding night. Juliet gives the nurse a ring to give to Romeo as a token of her love. In Friar Lawrence's cell, Romeo is overcome with grief and wonders what sentence the prince has decreed. Friar Lawrence tells him he is lucky. The prince has only banished him. Romeo claims that banishment is a penalty far worse than death since he will have to live. But without Juliet, the fire tries to counsel Romeo, but the youth is so unhappy that he will have none of it. Romeo falls to the floor. The nurse arrives, and Romeo desperately asks her for news of Juliet. He assumes that Juliet now thinks of him as a murderer and threatens to stab himself. Friar Lawrence stops him and scolds him for being unmanly. He explains that Romeo has much to be grateful for. He and Juliet are both alive, and after matters have calmed down, Prince Aeschylus might change his mind. The friar sets forth a plan, Romeo will visit Juliet that night, but make sure to leave her chamber, and Verona, before the morning. Romeo will then reside in Mantua until news of their marriage can be spread. The nurse hands Romeo their ring from Juliet, and this physical symbol of their love revives his spirits. The nurse departs, and Romeo bids Friar Lawrence farewell. He must prepare to visit Juliet and then flee to Mantua. Just before dawn, Romeo prepares to lower himself from Juliet's window to begin his exile. Juliet tries to convince Romeo that the bird calls they hear are from the nightingale, a night bird, rather than from the lark, a morning bird. Romeo cannot entertain her claims he must leave before the morning comes or be put to death. Juliet declares that the light outside comes not from the sun but from some meteor. Overcome by love, Romeo responds that he will stay with Juliet and that he does not care whether the prince's men kill him. Faced with this turnaround, Juliet declares that the bird they heard was the lark that it is dawn and he must flee. The nurse enters to warn Juliet that Lady Capulet is approaching. Romeo and Juliet tearfully part. Romeo climbs out the window. Standing in the orchard below her window, Romeo promises Juliet that they will see one another again. But Juliet responds that he appears paled, as one dead at the bottom of a tomb. Romeo answers that, to him, she appears the same way, and that it is only sorrow that makes them both look pale. Romeo hurries away as Juliet pulls in the ladder and begs fate to bring him back to her quickly. Lady Capulet calls to her daughter. Juliet wonders why her mother would come to speak to her so early in the morning. Unaware that her daughter is married to Romeo, Lady Capulet enters the room and mistakes Juliet's tears as continued grief for Tybalt. Lady Capulet tells Juliet of her deep desire to see the villain Romeo dead. March 5, 1980. In a complicated bit of punning every bit as impressive as the sexual punning of Mercutio and Romeo, Juliet leads her mother to believe that she also wishes for Romeo's death. When in fact she is firmly stating her love for him, Lady Capulet tells Juliet about Capulet's plan for her to marry Paris on Thursday, explaining that he wishes to make her happy. Juliet is appalled. She rejects the match, saying I will not marry yet and when I do, I swear, it shall be Romeo whom you know I hate ah, rather than Paris. 3.5.121A123. Capulet enters the chamber. When he learns of Juliet's determination to defy him, he becomes enraged and threatens to disown Juliet if she refuses to obey him. When Juliet entreats her mother to intercede, her mother denies her help. After Capulet and Lady Capulet storm away, Juliet asks her nurse how she might escape her predicament. The nurse advises her to go through with the marriage to Parisa. He is a better match she says, and Romeo is as good as dead anyhow. Though disgusted by her nurse's disloyalty, Juliet pretends to agree and tells her nurse that she is going to confess Friar Lawrence's. Juliet hurries to the friar, vowing that she will never again trust the nurse's counsel. If the friar is unable to help her, Juliet comments to herself, she still has the power to take her own life. In his cell, Friar Lawrence speaks with Paris about the latter's impending marriage to Juliet. Paris says that Juliet's grief about Tybalt's death has made her unbalanced and that Capulet, in his wisdom, has determined they should marry soon so that Juliet can stop crying and put an end to her period of mourning. The friar remarks to himself that he wishes he were unaware of the reason that Paris's marriage to Juliet should be delayed. Juliet enters 
and Paris speaks to her lovingly, if somewhat arrogantly. Juliet responds indifferently, showing neither affection nor dislike. She remarks that she has not married him yet. On the pretense that he must hear Juliet's confession, Friar Lawrence ushers Paris away, though not before Paris kisses Juliet once. After Paris leaves, Juliet asks Friar Lawrence for help, brandishing a knife and saying that she will kill herself rather than marry Paris. The friar proposes a plan, Juliet must consent to marry Paris then. On the night before the wedding, she must drink a sleeping potion that will make her appear dead. Juliet will be laid to rest in the Capulet tomb, and the friar will send word to Romeo in Mantua to help him retrieve her when she wakes up. She will then return to Mantua with Romeo, and be free to live with him away from their parents' hatred. Juliet consents to the plan wholeheartedly. Friar Lawrence gives her the sleeping potion. Juliet returns home where she finds Capulet and Lady Capulet preparing for the wedding. She surprises her parents by repenting her disobedience and cheerfully agreeing to marry Paris. Capulet is so pleased that he insists on moving the marriage up a day, to Wednesday, I at tomorrow. Juliet heads to her chambers to, ostensibly, prepare for her wedding. Capulet heads off to tell Paris the news. In her bedchamber, Juliet asks the nurse to let her spend the night by herself, and she repeats the request to Lady Capulet when she arrives, alone, clutching the vial given to her by Friar Lawrence. She wonders what will happen when she drinks it. If the friar is untrustworthy and seeks merely to hide his role in her marriage to Romeo, she might die or, if Romeo is late for some reason, she might awaken in the tomb and go mad with fear. She has a vision in which she sees Tybalt's ghost searching for Romeo. She begs Tybalt's ghost to quit its search for Romeo, and toasting to Romeo, drinks the contents of the vial. Early the next morning, the Capulet house is aflutter with preparations for the wedding. Capulet sends the nurse to go wake Juliet. She finds Juliet dead and begins to wail soon joined by both Lady Capulet and Capulet. Paris arrives with Friar Lawrence and a group of musicians for the wedding. When he learns what has happened, Paris joins in the lamentations. The friar reminds them all that Juliet has gone to a better place, and urges them to make ready for her funeral. Sorrowfully, they comply, and exit. Left behind, the musicians begin to pack up, their task cut short. Peter, the Capulet servant, enters and asks the musicians to play a happy tune to ease his sorrowful heart. The musicians refuse, arguing that playing such music would be inappropriate. Angered, Peter insults the musicians, who respond in kind. After singing a final insult at the musicians, Peter leaves. The musicians decide to wait for the mourners to return so that they might get to eat the lunch that will be served. On Wednesday morning, on a street in Mantua, a cheerful Romeo describes a wonderful dream he had the night before. Juliet found him lying dead, but she kissed him and breathed new life into his body. Just then, Balthasar enters, and Romeo greets him happily, saying that Balthasar must have come from Verona with news of Juliet and his father. Romeo comments that nothing can be ill in the world if Juliet is well. Balthasar replies that nothing can be ill. Then, for Juliet is well, she is in heaven. Found dead that morning at her home. Thunderstruck, Romeo cries out, Then I defy you, stars, May 1st 2024. He tells Balthazar to get him a pen and paper, with which he writes a letter for Balthazar to give to Montague, and to hire horses and says that he will return to Verona that night. Balthazar says that Romeo seems so distraught that he is afraid to leave him. But Romeo insists. Romeo suddenly stops and asks if Balthasar is carrying a letter from Friar Lawrence. Balthasar says he is not, and Romeo sends his servant on his way. Once Balthasar is gone, Romeo says that he will lie with Juliet that night. He goes to find an apothecary, a seller of drugs. After telling the man in the shop that he looks poor, Romeo offers to pay him well for a vial of poison. The apothecary says that he is just such a thing but that selling poison in Mantua carries the death sentence. Romeo replies that the apothecary is too poor to refuse the sale. The apothecary finally relents and sells Romeo the poison. Once alone, Romeo speaks to the vial, declaring that he will go to Juliet's tomb and kill himself. At his cell, Friar Lawrence speaks with Friar John, whom he had earlier sent to Mantua with a letter for Romeo. He asks John how Romeo responded to his letter. 
which describe the plan involving Juliet's false death. Friar John replies that he was unable to deliver the letter because he was shut up in a quarantined house due to an outbreak of plague. Friar Lawrence becomes upset, realizing that if Romeo does not know about Juliet's false death, there will be no one to retrieve her from the tomb when she awakes. He does not know that Romeo has learned of Juliet's death and believes is to be real. Sending for a crowbar, Friar Lawrence declares that he will have to rescue Juliet from the tomb on his own. He sends another letter to Romeo to warn him about what has happened, and he plans to keep Juliet in his cell until Romeo arrives. In the churchyard that night, Paris enters with a torch-bearing servant. He orders the page to withdraw, then begins scattering flowers on Juliet's grave. He hears a whistle the servant's warning that someone is approaching. He withdraws into the darkness. Romeo, carrying a crowbar, enters with Balthasar. He tells Balthasar that he has come to open the Capulet tomb to take back a valuable ring he had given Juliet. Then he orders Balthasar to leave, and, in the morning, to deliver to Montague the letter Romeo had given him. Balthasar withdraws, but, mistrusting his master's intentions, lingers to watch.